Well, hey there. I'm Jay. Welcome to my booth. So I got another behind-the-scenes peek at an audiobook for you, and I'm really, truly and sincerely stoked about this one. Uh, I was really happy when the folks at Penguin Random House said I could share this with you. Um, the book is called The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things. It's sort of like Coraline, uh, Lemony Snicket's series of unfortunate events. It's like a dark, mysterious world and uh, just really vibrant characters. And it was a lot of fun to do. The author behind this beautiful piece of work is Rob Renzetti. He, uh, as far as I know, this is his first foray into novel writing, but he is a seasoned veteran of the animation world. And I gotta say, I feel like it shows in his writing. Uh, he was the mind behind um, My Life as a Teenage Robot, a really successful Cartoon Network show. And he also worked on many others, including one of my favorites when I was younger, uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. So I'll read this passage for you and then dig into it. Just a bit of context so you kind of understand what's happening. A young boy by the name of Zenith Maelstrom. He's at his home over the summer and he's grounded. And a bag shows up on his front porch and his sister gets sucked into it by this horrible creature called Schlurp, uh, Zebel, or, uh, Zenith's name. And so Zenith goes in to, uh, dives in to save his sister. And on his journey, this is just one of my favorite scenes as he's trying to find out how he can save his sister from this horrible bag and the creature Schlurp. Um, and uh, so I'll share it with you, and then we'll talk about what went into it. Zenith had the strong impression that the collectory had sprung up naturally. No, not naturally. Magically. There was some otherworldly energy emanating from it. Maybe that's because you are in some other world, thought Zenith. His reverie was interrupted by a low hiss. Zenith looked around and saw that he'd strayed away from Creeble, who'd turned to the right and was now gesturing for him to follow. He jogged the short distance to the gargoyle, and they continued together around the perimeter of the collectory toward the scribe. As they approached, the air took on the smell of a classroom. Zenith saw that the bird was moving pieces of chalk from one large pile to several smaller piles, sorting it by color. The raven was a bit larger than he'd originally thought, and better dressed as well. The blackbird was wearing an emerald green sweater vest and a large pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. His dapper attire contrasted with the state of his wings, which were riddled with holes. Creeble called out to the raven. Greetings to you, O scribe of the Collectory of Grabarg. We, our humble seekers, have the history and the details and the truth. Creeble placed her left hand over her forehead, then her mouth, and finally her heart. Please, grant us the smallest moment of your... Yes, yes, greetings. The bird grumbled without looking up. Tell me, uh, do you see any iridescent chalk in here? Uh, Hugh has left everything in the most dreadful disorder, and I cannot find my special iridescent chalk. Creeble seemed puzzled by the interruption. Uh, um, we seek humbly for... Yes, yes, you seek history and details and such. I heard you the first time. But uh, where is that blasted chalk? Creeble looked at Zenith helplessly. Zenith screwed up his face. Was she really looking for guidance from him? He took a step forward, reached toward the chalk pile, and said, We're happy to help you look. The enormous bird pecked at his hand, barely missing his forefinger. Use your eyes, not your hands. None but the scribe may wield the enchanted chalk. After a moment of awkward silence, the raven suddenly exclaimed, Ah, there you are. He plunged his beak down into the disordered pile and emerged with a long piece of sparkling chalk. Its color shifted from yellow to blue-green to purple as he raised it triumphantly. 
He chuckled as he hopped over and placed it on an ornately carved but weathered wooden roll-top desk, which stood by the sorted piles of chalk. The raven admired the iridescent chalk for a moment as it twinkled, then swiveled quickly to face them. Now, what brings such unworthy creatures before the great scribe? He squawked loudly. Creeble smiled at Zenith. She lowered her head again. We are humble seekers of the history and the details and the truth. Please grant us the smallest moment of your time and the tiniest morsel of your vast knowledge. And what new knowledge can you offer the scribe? asked the haughty bird. Uh, pardon me, honourable scribe, we seek knowledge, we do not offer it. This, pronounced the raven with an expansive wave of his whole ridden wings, is the collectory. The scribe collects knowledge, he does not dispense it. He looked back and forth between Zenith and Creeble. With those he finds worthy, he may, on occasion, exchange knowledge. So, I ask again, what knowledge can you offer? Knowledge, eh, knowledge. The gargoyle's eyes darted around nervously. They came to rest on Zenith's face. She gestured dramatically at him. My companion is a traveller from Terra Firmament. He has many details from his home to share. The scribe seemed intrigued. He ogled Zenith through the lenses of his oversized glasses. His eyes looked huge and hungry. Well, well, from terra firmament, you say. Rare to have a visitor from that troubled land. He resumed a more sceptical expression. Rare, but not unheard of. Others of your kind have imparted the history and details of your homeland. What have you to add? It was Zenith's turn to stammer. Um, uh, I can tell you the latest news and sports scores, current events, I guess you'd call it. He swiveled back. He swiveled the backpack off his shoulder. And I've got this physics book, if you want a more intense scientific stuff. Science? Did you say you have a book about science? The bird used its beak to pull open the backpack's main pocket and gazed with wonder at the book inside. This is a firm and craft that the scribe has long sought the knowledge of. And you're welcome to it, Zenith said before he pulled the backpack away. But in exchange, you'll tell me what you know about my sister. So it's a super fun passage, really rich characters. And so what I really enjoyed personally about this one is the author presents such a rich and detailed world. Not that other authors don't, but in books like this where the world is so specific and the characters are so big and expansive, it really gives me as the narrator license to fill the characters out instead of sort of fitting my own narration in. So I get the opportunity to give much bigger performances than maybe I would have the opportunity to in most cases. Um, in addition to that, because the world is so odd and magical, I'm not really bound in terms of the character choices in terms of what I want to do with them. So I just sort of pick archetypes. And fortunately, the author was really um, uh, excited to work on specifically what he had in mind with the characters. Uh, so we were able to have a quick back and forth and hammer down what he thought he, he had in mind. And he was really respectful of sort of my interpretation of the characters. And it was really helpful to bring these guys to life. Um, Creeble is this really tiny gargoyle, uh, and she has a fascination with eating earwax and um, belly button goop, I guess you'd call it, and she calls them grits. 
and it's very disgusting, but that's her fascination. And so the, she's always bartering for more grits in some way. And so she's this little creepy thing with long fingernails. And so uh, I tried with her voice to give sort of like a crawling, scrambling, uh, and her mind kind of darts and floats for a second and then goes over here. And uh, she's always kind of hungry and ravenous in some ways, but she's also very uh, intelligent and uh, her main thing is bartering. There's always some sort of exchange with her, so it's kind of always a salesman-y type tactic. So that's kind of where we went with her. Of course, the scribe is very, very well drawn out in this book, and so he kind of just happened out of the blue, right out of the gate. Of course, Sir Ian McKellen was a huge influence on me and my acting generally, but this character, I just, I love that voice that I can do, and um, it seemed perfect for him where he's this big pompous bird who thinks that he's better than everyone else in his knowledge, but you'll find out that he's also kind of wounded later in the book. And of course, Zenith is just a, uh, he's a preteen. Um, I think he's 11 or 12 in this book. And so he's a precocious sort of go-getter. He's scrappy. Uh, he's he's gone into this really dangerous world to save his sister. So he's incredibly brave. And he's he like challenges the bird in this, but in exchange. So I wanted to give him just sort of an edgy, yeah, you know, maybe um, that kind of kid, you know. Uh, so those are three of the characters, and this book has many, many more, which is why I found it such a joy to narrate. Um, and it's out now, so if you've got kids that uh, are into this kind of thing and around this age, it's I think it's a good book. Uh, I know I'm biased somewhat, but I had a really great time reading it. Um, so I hope this was helpful for you. If you have any questions about this, the process, anything else voiceover related, always feel free to reach out to me down below or via my website. And if you're interested in coaching, working on something like this with me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that's available on my website as well. Until the next one of these, I will see you there and be well. Toodles. <laughs>